going to like stand over here because the podium just weirds me out. So I, I hope you don't mind. Folks, I'm Mayor Mark Bouton from the city of Danbury. It's my pleasure and honor to be here today. Just spent, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking a little bit about why this campaign is so important. I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and how I got involved in politics. And then certainly I'll throw it up with some questions. You guys have any questions? If not, it makes a lot of First of all, I applaud you for being here on a beautiful day on a Sunday. You guys are true conservatives if you're here on a Sunday afternoon. Anybody here from Central Connecticut State University? All right. Those are my homeboys right there. I'm a Central grad. Uh, anybody from Western? Western, make it up here? It's like you know, two hours away, you think it's the end of the year. Okay, no. uh, But anyway, I went to Western for my uh, uh, postgraduate degree. Uh, let me talk a little bit about who I am and about uh, uh, how I got involved in politics. I was born and raised in Danbury. I was educated in Danbury Public Schools. I attended Central Connecticut State University, as I mentioned here, and uh, Western Connecticut State University, where I earned a master's degree in educational psychology. When I was in school, I had to figure out a way to pay for school, so I joined the United States Army Reserve. Uh, it was a proud moment in my life to be able to serve in the reserves. I did not serve in Vietnam. Not that it wasn't joking at the moment, though I was saying. <laughs> so uh, uh, I didn't do any of that, uh, but I was honored to be able to help pay for my tuition. When I got done paying off my bills, I went back to Danbury and I became a high school teacher. I taught social studies for 14 years, and it was some of the greatest uh, times of my life. I got married, settled down, and kind of wanted to stay out of politics. My dad was in politics, I hated politics. People were fighting and all the time. People were calling up on the phone and like harassing my parents late at night. I'm like, I don't want that life. I, I didn't want to be involved in politics. Just my wife, Phyllis, who just snuck in the door. Um, so uh, I sort of stayed away from it. And um, kind of like the Godfather movie, they sunk me in. And I got involved. And I got appointed to my little planning commission. And then I ran for uh, state representative in 1998. I served for two terms in the State House of Representatives. I was on the Education Committee, the Planning and Development Committee, the Internship Committee. Any interns in here? You guys do that at the legislature and all? Anybody? Okay, good. Got the goals here. Just done that. Um, and uh, uh, in 2000, I uh, was reelected to the legislature, served on the Environment Committee's ranking member. In 2001, the mayor had been mayor for 12 years in Danbury decided not to run for office. Now, just to set up Danbury a little bit for you, there's like no Republicans in Danbury, okay? There's none. Like, if you walk down the street and you don't know the secret handshake or a big trip, you don't know the Republican handshake or a Anyway, so there's no Republicans there. It's really hard uh, to get elected. People called me up and said, hey, you got to run for mayor. I said, I don't really want to run for mayor. I got this nice gig. I'm teaching school. I got a small business. I got married. You know, I really don't want to do it. And people kind of begged me and begged me, and we talked about it. Finally, I said, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to die. It's killing me. <laughs> okay, finally, I said, I'm going to run for mayor. So I ran for mayor in 2001, uh, got elected in a city that's three to one Democrat to Republican. Three to one Democrat to Republican. And we had a great grassroots organization. I had a lot of young people like yourself. We were knocking doors, we were everywhere we needed to be, we were there, and then we were beyond that. And it was really exciting. And on election night, Election night, about 10 o'clock, we figured out I won by about 130 votes out of about 18,000 casts. So it was a really close race. And then I woke up in the morning, and we had a really good party, because we knew that party at the end. I woke up in the morning, and I realized, wow, I just got elected mayor, and I've got 17 Democrats and four Republicans on my city council, on my legislative body. And in Danbury, the mayor, you know, there's no city manager. You're it. You get to call the shots. I said, this is going to be a long and difficult two years. And you know what? It was a long and difficult two years. But in 2003, I got reelected by 65% of the vote. I brought in 17 council people, so we completely flipped it around. And we had 17 Republicans and four Democrats. And ever since 03, I won every election by 65% of the vote or more. And I've carried a supermajority, our supermajority on a local legislative body. Now, I mentioned that, mentioned that to you because it's important. It's important that we not just get Tom Foley and Mark Batman elected. We also get people like Tim Plunges like because we can't win and we're not going to be able to enact our agenda if we don't have more state representatives and more state senators. And that's just a fact, folks. We have the most liberal, left-leaning legislature in the history of mankind. Completely out of control. And they will spend your money, your nickel, in every wacky way they can possibly think of. And so that's why we need to get more people elected. 
Folks, there's really three things that we need to, need to do, and I know Tom Foley's talked to you about them. I'm a teacher, so I always call them the three R's. Real simple. One, we have to revitalize our economic development strategy. For whatever reason, our economic development strategy over the last 18 months is not working. We lost 100,000 jobs in Connecticut. And we're not only losing jobs to Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the BRIC countries now. We're losing jobs to New Hampshire, Michigan, Rhode Island, places that you never thought could compete with us. And that's because we have one of the most anti-business mentalities of any state in the world. We're 45th in terms of being a business-friendly state. There's a problem with that. And I'm going to tell you why you want to be concerned. Because you're investing over $100,000, if not more, into your education. And when you leave this institution, or Central, or wherever you leave, there's not going to be a job for you in this state. Age 18 to 35 has the highest rate of unemployment of any, any demographic, any de demographic in the state of Connecticut. Almost 30%. You ought to be fired up. Why? Because this legislature has driven business out of this state. And when they drove business out of the state, they took the jobs with them. And they're not coming back until we change our attitude and our economic development strategy. Two, we've got to redesign state governments to a bit. There are 55,000 employees in the state. We have 3 million people. Our population hasn't grown at all in the last 10 years, but our state employees have grown by approximately 14%. So, nice people, they work hard. I'm sure they all have good job descriptions. Not sure what everybody does. We need to look at that. We also have to make our government a little bit more business friendly, excuse me, a little bit more resident friendly. What I mean by that is too often people involved in government, who serve in government, begin serving the bureaucracy and not, they forget who they work for. They forget that they work for the residents uh, of the state of Connecticut. Let me give an example. How many people in here, are, raise your hand if you ever uh, uh, walked into the DMV? Have you ever been to the DMV? Did you guys like that experience? Was it good for you? What is up with that place? You're telling me in the 21st century we can't figure out a way to maybe get your license and your registration in a timely manner without having the, the number up there so you feel like a cow or something that you gotta go up and that's me. And why is it every time you go to the DMV and you wait two hours in line, you get the front of line, you never have the right paperwork. And you never, you can stop at the help desk, they can explain exactly what you need, you can run around all morning picking it up and you go up there and somebody goes out and form so he's not filled out, back to the line for another two hours. There's something wrong with that, right? You guys use computers, you use iPhones and iPads and laptops and all that stuff. You've got to be doing all of that online. Folks, you could probably save 12, 13,000 jobs right there in terms of being able to downsize the state government. So we have to be friendly in terms of residents, customer friendly, consumer friendly, and we also have to think about a smaller, more agile state government. Thirdly, we've got to rethink the role of government in the state of Connecticut. We've got to talk about what services should government offer. How should they be offered? Who should pay for them? And why should we pay for them? That's a larger, more global discussion that Tom Foley and I believe we're going to have, but it's something that needs to happen in the time where it needs to happen. The fact of the matter is, government right now is unsustainable the way it is. It's too expensive, we'll never be able to afford it. Again, why should you care? How many UConn students do we have in here? How'd you like that 5% tuition that you got? How'd that feel? Is that good? There are kids out there that did not come back to this university this fall because they couldn't afford the tuition rate. People have lost the opportunity for a top-notch education because of tuition rate. Okay, so what was it for? I don't know. We've got an athletic director. I know this is Harrison. I'm a huge Husky fan. Go on, I want to get that out. Folks, we paid the athletic director at the University of Connecticut $350,000. It's $350,000. And he wanted a $50,000 bonus because they made the ball game last year. That's insane. Our last president at this institution had an inauguration that was bigger than Barack Obama's. That's more money. That's why some kid out there can't come to school today because we can't pay those kinds of bills. So the fact of the matter is we have to rein in spending. You state university people, you're not immune here. We got a chancellor of the CSU system. Again, a wonderful gentleman. Makes $380,000 a year, approximately. But you have a president at your university. Central has a president, Westcott has a president, Eastern has a president. Why do we need a chancellor here and then four more presidents that we have to pay again to do the job the chancellor's supposed to be doing? You should care about that stuff because it's your money, it's your tuition money, and it's the money you're borrowing to pay for your education that you're going to be paying off for the next 20 years of your life. 
that's why it's important to you. And that's why this election is critical to you. We've got about 43 days to make our case to the residents out there that we cannot elect Dan Malloy and Nancy White. They are more of the same. They will borrow and spend this state into oblivion. They'll hike up tuition rates on you through the roof. All the name of bigger government that does less for the residents of the state. Folks, I'm Mayor Mark Bowden from the city of Danbury. I ask for your vote, your support. Get involved. Go to our website. Knock some doors. Look us up. We want to get you engaged in this campaign. And with that, I'm going to throw up some few questions. If you have any questions, concerns, issues, anything I can do for you, clean your windows, wash your car, check your grass, lady, and <laughs> Yes? Um, I was just curious. When you were talking about your background and when you were first elected as mayor, um, you said that initially that the council was completely or almost completely democratic. Yeah. How how is it that you were able to get elected and then change that in Danbury as a Republican in a place where Republicans aren't that popular? Um, that's a great question. Look, here's the thing that we really stink at. We're getting better. We are getting better. Communicate, right? If you go out to the student union right now and walk around that room and you go, hey, um, are you guys like uh, who's a Republican here? Every day are Republicans. They're only for who? The rich people, right? I don't know about you guys, but I ain't rich. I drive a 93 <coughs> Chevy pickup truck when I just got fixed, and my wife won't let me buy a new one. So uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we're not rich people. So we've got to change that whole perception of what our party is. You know, I, I'll be frank with you. I'm concerned we need, to, uh, we need to be more ethnically diverse. We need to do more reaching out to, to other uh, groups within the state, within this country, to explain, hey, we've got the same value system as you do. You want safe streets, we want safe streets. You want good schools, we want good schools. You want strong families, we want strong families. That message never makes it out because we get painted, frankly, as a bunch of rich, white, old men that are making the decisions for the United States of America. And so it's our job to be able to change the dynamic of what this party is and what it can do. So communication is critical. Now think about it for a second. Think about why do people hate, particularly up here, why do people not like George Bush? Let's be honest, they didn't like him. He, won, he lost kind of about 65 or so. What was the biggest hang-up that you heard from your friends, parents, whatever? Anybody want to throw out? What did George Bush have a hard time doing? Speaking. Speaking. A very basic function, right? So and it was funny. He would get up and give a speech, and he would always like pause. He'd have that pause there, and he thought, OK. I'm ready. There's something really profound that's going to come up. And you'd be like, the reason we go to church is because it's on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just waiting for that big moment in the speech. It's never there. And it drove you crazy. But you know, I met George Bush personally. I looked in his eye and had a conversation with him. He's incredibly intelligent. Incredibly intelligent man. And he actually was a very well-spoken person. He just gave me speeches work his number one thing. Barack Obama, conversely, inspires when, he, when he's out, when he's really out and speaking. So I think those are the kinds of things in terms of communicating you just got to get better. Sorry, I'm not right there. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> what else? Any other questions, concerns? No? Well, listen, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a great country. It's the greatest country in the world. Don't forget that. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you.